Okay. Uh, first things first, let's go through some uh, announcements. Our daily quiz number 21 is available on GradeScope. Four questions, multiple choice. Please answer that on GradeScope. It shouldn't take you too much time, maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, as I have pointed out, uh, I have seen a, a pretty significant drop in the, the number of submissions that have uh, b been coming in. Um, I really hope that everybody sort of turns it around and during the last couple of weeks, uh, our number of submissions go up. So I'm, I'm really hoping that it turns around. Um, happy Friday. Today is uh, April 16th. The homework that is due tonight is homework 11. Homework 12 will be posted. Uh, I, I, I'll post it over the weekend and you'll have uh, one full week to uh, complete homework 12. Studio 7, the scrolling display studio. Many of you have already submitted it. Excellent job. Uh, how many more homeworks are there? How many Fridays do we have? Uh, those many homeworks. So maybe a couple Fridays. So I think 23rd and 30th, right? So two more uh, homeworks. 12 and 13. Yeah. So we have homeworks. Um, Studio 7 due April 21st. Uh, you know, I'm really glad to see the, the, the kind of phrases that you guys chose. Some of them are very personal. Uh, some of them are funny uh, so I, I i'm you know keeping track of that so keep them coming um, i'm glad that you guys are enjoying uh, the studio seven uh, at least i hope you're you are enjoying studio seven studio eight is going to be posted sometime uh, later it's not going to take too much time but it is going to be due the last wednesday of the semester so that's where we are at in terms of announcements now let's continue talking about the two types of finite state machines one was Moore, the other one was Mealy. And they both, the distinction over here between the finite state machines was based on how the outputs were, what were the outputs of the flip flops dependent on? What was the output of the finite state machine dependent on? Was it dependent only on the current state, which essentially is the current uh, outputs of all the flip flops? Or in the case of Mealy, it was dependent on two things. One, the current state, but also the current inputs. So because there is dependence on current inputs, that essentially means that the outputs of Mealy finite state machine can really change at any time because the input is controlled by a user. The input changes, the output also changes at the same time. Um, but in the case of Moore, that is not the case because the outputs over here depend on the current state. So they are synchronous with respect to the clock because the current state is going to go to the next state based on the active clock edge. That's why we classified Moore as synchronous and we classified Mealy as an asynchronous type finite state machine. We are going to go through a very quick review to, to sort of bring everybody uh, give everybody a quick recap and then we can continue our discussion on the vending machine uh, finite state machine that we have been designing so the the state machine structure as far as moore is concerned has certain inputs uh, it goes through some combinational logic over here muxes decoders logic gates and whatnot the, the there is excitation provided to the state memory so flip-flops go over here and the outputs of flip-flops go into another possible combinational network. We are calling that the output logic. This could again be multiplexers, logic gates, decoders, whatever combinational logic design elements that we have learned. And that's what drives the final outputs. Now, in the case of Moore, the outputs are only dependent on the current state. As you can see, there is no connection between the inputs and the outputs directly. Right? So inputs will change uh, the excitation to the state memory that may in turn change the current state and only that changes the outputs in the case of Moore. And when we start looking at the similar state machine structure for Mealy, I hope you will, uh, you will notice that there will be a connection between the inputs and the uh, output logic block over here. We we'll talk more uh, when we get there. So the first Moore machine state diagram that we looked at was for a vending machine. And the objective was 
the user can input nickels or dimes and the vending machine should vend an item that costs 15 cents. So if you pay two dimes, it is going to keep the change. We are going to ignore the clock triggering the uh, flip-flops, but instead we are going to look at transitioning transitions between one state to the other happening when the user inserts a coin, whether it be nickel or it may be a dime. But we are only going to uh, use one coin slot. So that means that the user can only uh, enter only one coin at a time. And another assumption that we are making is that the user must hit reset to restart the machine after it has vended that food item. Based on that, we went through uh, a couple of options. The first option was have a state in our state diagram corresponding to each and every cent, right? So zero cents, no money right now in the vending machine. One cent, two cents, and so on, all the way to 15 cents, because that's where we stop, 15 cents. Why? Because you need to vend the item at that point. And then you hit reset to kind of initialize your FSM. What is the reset used for? It is to uh, bring it back to the original state, state zero, where there is no money, right? So this could be automatic. This could be uh, sort of uh, triggered by, all right, as soon as you went the item, you come back to state zero. But in this case, the assumption that we are making is that the user has to specifically reset it in order to come to state zero. Another use of reset is if suppose you are in any other state, maybe not you know very applicable in this vending machine um, example, but the reset is generally used to bring things back to the original state, right? So that's what we are using the reset for. The second option, as far as the states were concerned, was a bit more uh, uh, a bit more meaningful as far as this particular example is concerned, because the user is only entering nickels and dimes. We can have no money. 5 cents, 10 cents, 20, 15 cents as the four different states your vending machine can be in. So we, we mark that state zero here, state one here, state two here, state three here. And then we completed the state diagram by drawing in the arrows or arcs depending on how the user enters nickels and dimes. So if you enter a nickel, it goes from state zero to state one and so on. Now, Another thing to note over here is the output, which is to wend or not wend, is tied to the state of the uh, is tied to the state in our FSM, which essentially means that this is going to be a Moore type state machine. Output is tied to the state. That's why we are writing it inside the circle as opposed to on an arrow. If it appears on an arrow, that means that it is going to be a mealy machine because the outputs can change based on two things one state two inputs so it's going to be on the arrow now we also did a very simple calculation about how many flip-flops we would, would we eventually need to make this vending machine and the answer for this guy was two and the way we computed that was there are four states right four states that means the states are what current outputs of the flip-flops and if you have two outputs of the flip-flop, let's call them Q1 and Q0, right? Let's call them Q1 and Q0. This could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? So each of that could signify a particular state. For example, you may use this particular state encoding where you say, if Q1 and Q0 are 0, 0, that signifies state 0. And you could do that for state 1, 2, 3. So, that's the reason why we would need two flip-flops in this so four four states two flip-flops and you, you as you go up in the number of states you go up to four to eight to 16 and so on you will need three flip-flops four flip-flops and so on so the the number of flip-flops will keep on increasing as you have more and more states which is going to happen if you have a very interesting complex uh, uh, fsm to design and we'll take a look at examples in which we can add a lot of functionality to our uh, state machines and you will see that number increasing. All right. So the same thing that we derived was 
sort of neatly drawn up uh, on this slide. This is exactly the same as the picture that we actually drew from scratch. Over here, we are sort of highlighting a few things. One is five cents that is indicating the current state of the uh, finance state machine. The output is part of the state itself. Zero indicating don't vend. One indicating please vend the item. And then we are also highlighting that this particular D, whatever you have, is the input that causes that transition. N or D essentially means either nickel or dime will take the vending machine from 10 cents state to 15 cents state. So that's sort of where we left off. Uh, the next thing that we are going to talk about is state encoding. Remember, we had two options. One was uh, use all the states, meaning zero cents, one cent, two cents, so on up to 15 cents. But if we chose something like that, we would actually need 16 states. 16 states would correspond to four flip flops, right? So that would be. Uh, equivalent to encoding the actual numbers. How much do you have in the vending machine? But that's not really useful for this particular example because the user is only uh, entering a nickel or dime. So in this case, this particular state encoding makes more sense. Zero cents, five cents, 10 cents, 15 cents. So that could be state zero, state one, state two, state three. That's exactly what we did. And if we did that, if we did that we saw that you only need two flip flops to do this. So you're saving flip-flops that go into the implementation of the FSM based on the choice of state encoding, right? So whenever you have a FSM design in front of you, you will have to think about these, these things. One, it is going to be an open-ended design. Everybody can have their own sort of way to go about designing it. Yes, you may have some constraints and you may have to make certain assumptions but it is an open-ended problem in general. Now, if it is an open-ended problem, every student or every designer may come up with their own technique, their, their own criteria to design that FSM. Some may choose to do it in smaller number of flip-flops and some may choose to have more number of states, consequently, more number of flip-flops required in that case, right? So th there is a there is an aspect of cost built into the initial design uh, choices that the designer makes over here, which is why, in my opinion, all the steps that are involved in FSM design, the first step is to sketch the state diagram or state transition diagram. So this tends to be the most time consuming. Uh, needs you to be a little bit more creative. Uh, there is no one way of doing it. So your, your, your creative juices need to be flowing here to come up with the state diagram, right? So because there is no template for this, everybody can have their own. Now, if the, if the, if the, if the constraint is that do it in as less states as possible, then you really need to think very hard about your choices. That is usually where the challenge is. All the other steps, once you have the state diagram, and I'll show it to you, once you have the state diagram, all the other steps are going to be very straightforward. Plug and chug. All right, so let's see. We are going to move forward. And next, we are going to spend time talking about a Mealy option, Mealy Finance State Machine. So I hope you have seen the change here. The only difference that we have between the state machine structure from Moore to Mealy is that highlighted line. Now the outputs that are outputs of some combinational logic uh, block here, output logic G, some combinational logic, right? So this is combinational here. So, so no feedback, no memory there. Uh, sequential here. So yes, memory there using flip-flops and combinational again over here. So no memory there. Now there is a dependence on inputs. So as soon as the input uh, user changes the input, it is going to cause a change in the inputs to this combinational block, which will change the outputs. And there is another way of doing it as well, where change of current state will trigger an output change, which is sort of similar to the Moore FSM. So that's the sort of the only difference between their structures. This 
state diagram is doing the exact same job of vending machine, but this is going to be a melee state machine. Exactly the same. We still have the same four states. State 0, state 1, state 2, state 3. Corresponding to vending machine has 0 cents, 5 cents, 10 cents and 15 cents. And now what we are doing is, for example, if you are in 0 cents, if you are in state 0, here is your input highlighted in green. If you get a nickel, your output is going to be tied to the input as well, right? So the output is 0, don't wend, but you change the state from state 0 to state 1. Do I see that? So this is state 0, this is state 1 based on what, what, what we uh, what we named these states uh, earlier. So you're moving from state zero to state one when you get a nickel and when that input changes, when you the user inputs a nickel right away, the output is going to change to zero, don't wind, right? So we are still able to do the same job of vending machine, but now we are doing this with a melee state machine. And we can look at other examples as well, right? So for example, over here, if you are in state 2, vending machine has 10 cents. The user enters a nickel or the user enters a dime. The output right away becomes a 1 because you have started vending the, uh, vending the item here. But your state transition goes from state 2 to state 3. So you are essentially changing the output right away. You are not waiting for the machine to go to state 3. You are not waiting for that current state to go to the next state. You are changing the output immediately. So there's a quicker response in the output in that case. But all the other transitions are happening exactly for the same set of inputs. So for example, over here, when you are in state zero, you get a dime, you go to state two, exactly the same as before, right? So if I go back, exactly the same as before, state two, you get a nickel, go to, a, go to state two, right? So it's the same, uh, same transition, same inputs causing that transition but now your outputs have become part of the arrows instead of being the states. And this aspect of melee machines is what is going to help you reduce the number of states. And we'll take a look at an example where we do that. In this example, there is no reduction in the number of states. We still have four states, which means we still need two flip-flops to do this, right? So still need two flip-flops here. Need flip-flops to implement. The only difference is that my output, so I can show the output here, uh, there is the output. So all the outputs I'm going to highlight in pink. These are all the outputs. Uh, I think there, I think there's it. Oh, one more. I may have missed one or yeah, there it is. Okay, so all the outputs are now highlighted in pink, right? So and they're now tied to the arrows as opposed to the state. That's how you can quickly identify which type of machine it is going to be. So now you can see them side by side, right? So on the left, you have the Moore state machine on the right, you have the melee state machine, same four states, the same inputs causing that transition. However, the difference is in the output. Over here, outputs are tied to the states. Over here, outputs are tied to the arrows causing that transition and so on. And as I said, because the outputs are now tied to the inputs, that will allow the user or the designer to reduce the number of states. And we'll see example of that, which essentially is captured by this statement. Sometimes the melee machine can be simplified. In this case, we are not simplifying it. Still need two flip-flops. So to, to, to go about that example in which we can reduce the number of states, we are going to talk about a different type of example. It's, we will start with more, and then we will talk about a melee alternative. Hopefully in the melee one, we would have reduced the number of states. So the first question I'm going to ask you guys is this. You see the state diagram over here. How many flip-flops do you need to implement this? Number of flip-flops. 
required. Two is the right answer. Now you have three states. When you round up to the next highest power of two, you have essentially four states. One is not being used. And when you take the log of that to the base of two, you get two. So you need two flip-flops to do this. Absolutely right. And you know, my, my, my uh, philosophy is that with every state diagram, I'm continuously going to ask you guys that. How many flip-flops do you need? Because I've seen in the past students getting that confused with the number of states. So I'm going to make it a point to ask you guys every, every time you see a state diagram. All right. So what are we doing in this example? We are designing a, a finite state machine that can detect two consecutive, two or more consecutive ones on an input. Again, we have a one bit input, one wire that is our input. And if that input, the, the, the bits that are coming in, in the form of a bit stream, continuous bit stream coming in on that input, if it has two or more consecutive ones, it should assert the output. In other words, it is detecting, right? So this is a uh, detection, detection of two or more consecutive ones has to be consecutive on input right so the when the output is one that essentially means that the la at least the last two input bits were one right that's exactly what we are trying to do so how are we going to do this let us let us have a state called state zero, right? This is state zero. I can also say state zero, state one, state two. So my state zero is corresponding to the last input being zero, which essentially means the, the it got a zero, right? So I'm gonna call this got zero state. So when the last input was a zero, that signifies that the FSM is in state zero. State one is what? Last two inputs were zero one. Because you think about this. Uh, let's see. If I go after. All right. So when you start, right? So suppose you start here, right? So I have it over here. I have this is sort of my reset to initialize it. And I have state zero over here. Now I have said state zero corresponds to got zero, right? I did not say state zero is got one. Why didn't I do that? ideas i said my first state is got zero i did not say my first state is a got one because you would have a zero zero uh what do you mean So I'm, ha I'm saying my state zero because of the arrows, uh, not really. So I'm not keeping track of the first bit coming in is a one because then there is always, then there, there, there will always be one. Um, right, you're, so you're on the right track, but I'm not calling a specific state for got one because I am using state zero to reset my machine got a zero no matter the past state it is always that's right if you got a zero no matter what the past state was it's always going to be state zero that's right that's exactly the reason why you want to start off with 
state zero and I'm calling that as an indication of got zero. And I'm also using the same state to initialize things, to reset things. That's why I don't have a got one state. Now, from there, there are two possibilities, right? From state zero, there are again two possibilities. You could get a zero from here, you could get a one from here. Any ideas what I should do if I get a zero? Now you are in the state zero, right? You go back to the same state, exactly. So if you get a zero, you go back to the same state, right? What should you do if you get a one? Well, I need to keep track of two, at least two consecutive ones, right? So I not only need a state to capture this one, but I also need a state to capture current one is one, but the previous one was zero, right? I need both of that. So that's why I have another state called S1, which is essentially my got zero one, right? The last two inputs were zero and then followed by a one. When I get a one, you see that? So you reset things to S0 and if you keep getting zero, you will simply stay there because you don't move forward. That's not the application over here. We are not detecting zeros. We are detecting at least two consecutive ones. Now, suppose you are in state zero. There are again two possibilities. You could get a zero here or you could get a one here. What should I do if I get a zero there? Uh, would you group this with one zero? Uh, which one? So got so one zero, right? Andrew, the 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 statement you are saying. Would you group this with one zero? That is, got a one. Now you got a zero, right? So the question is, what are you going to do now? If you got a zero, where are you going to go? Go back to uh not s1 go to s0 right because you have lost the consecutive ones so i don't need to save anything i just go back so if i get a zero from here i'm simply going to go back to s0 because i don't need to you know care for this one i've lost it that's not my application my application here is Detection of two or more consecutive ones. Consecutive ones. I've lost it. I've got a zero. I've broke the broken the chain. So I, I have to go back. Now, if I got a one, that would be interesting because that means that the last two inputs were one and a one. So that allows me or that requires me to make another state, state two. And I go to state two when I get a one there. And I'm going to call this state got one one, right? Last two inputs were one one. You see that? Now let's let's go back to this and try to look at how the design went. State zero, kick things off. Indicates got zero. Now, if you are in state zero and you keep getting zeros, you have a self loop. You will stay there because that's not the requirement. The detection is for two or con two or more consecutive ones. So you don't care, you just stay there. Uh, also, what is the output? The output is a zero there. We are designing a Moore machine. Right? You are not detecting consecutive ones, so you make your output there. But if you are in state zero, what would be the next thing? But the next thing is, you your next input could be a zero, could be a one. If it is a zero, you go back, self loop. If it is a one, you make progress towards the one one situation, the detection situation. So that's why we have captured it into a new, new state, state one. That indicates that the last two inputs were zero and one, zero and one. And even here, your output is zero. Why? Because that is not one one, that is zero one, right? Still, the last two inputs are not 
consecutive ones. Now from state one, again, we have two possibilities. New input could be a zero, new input could be a one. If it's a zero, then you have kind of broken the chain and you go back. If you have a one, that is interesting. That is what we require to capture. So we are going to move to a new state called S2 in which my output is going to become what? What is the output in state two? A one, beautiful. That's my detection. I got consecutive ones. Now from state two, again, I need to ask the same question. What if I get a zero? What if I get a one? Right? So the last two inputs were uh, uh, one, one. From state two, what should I do if I get a zero? What should I do if I get a one? So loop to a zero, you guys are right. If you, are, if you get a zero, you go back, reset it again. And if you get a one, we have to detect two or more consecutive ones. So that would be a self loop for a one. And your output over there continues to be detecting it. You can see that? So three states, we have talked about, you know, how do you go about building that, right? So uh, can you combine arrows to make it look neater? Sure. Uh, if I was doing this, I would be doing it like this. I would, I would be doing this. I would do it that way. So it, 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 it it's the same information. Uh, it's just that it's going to allow you to uh, keep things clean, like you pointed out. Uh, this will become very, very uh, sort of, it, it, it's, it was not necessary here, but imagine a state diagram which, in which you have 10 states, then you will absolutely need uh, this kind of a mechanism to keep things clean. All right, let's uh, go back here and sort of verify that this is exactly what we have drawn here. That's exactly what we have come up with. State zero, output is zero. State one, output is zero. State two, got two ones, output is a one. You keep getting a one, stay there. From state zero, you keep getting a zero, stay there. If you get a one from state zero, you come to this one. If you make progress, come to state two. Now, um, so on the homework and other stuff, we can do that, right? Absolutely, you can. Yes. Can we do this with a mealy machine? Can we do this with a mealy machine? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. You can do this with any machine. Now, let me also throw another uh, trick at you. The way I sort of uh, go about doing things like this in the form of detecting a certain pattern, input pattern is this. Uh, let me draw in general, right? In general, what I say is, the question I ask is, what is the desired pattern? What is the desired pattern to unlock or detect, right? So the, what is the pattern that we are trying to detect? Well, the answer is for this problem, two or more consecutive ones, right? One, one, you're trying to detect that. The moment I decide this, the moment I figured this out, I'm going to put in states that will have that. One, one, right? So I will, right away, I have those three states, state zero, state one, state two. Initialize, get the one, get the one. Right. So that's my sort of the good path. That's what I want to detect. And then I can also put in the zero, zero, one here outputs. Once I figure this out, then I will put in all the other options into it. What if you get a zero? Go back. What if you get a zero here? Go back to state zero. What if you get a zero? Go back to state zero. 
what if you keep getting one okay there right so you start off with that good good path or whatever you're trying to you know that 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 is indicated by your problem statement and then once you figure that out which is going to be pretty straightforward then you go about looking at all the other possibilities and then draw the arrows for that right so this will keep it a little bit more uh, streamlined all right questions about this how did the how did we draw the moore machine state diagram questions about that So now let's try to see if we can do the same thing, but with a mealy machine. Now with the mealy machine, what do we have? We have an arrow on which we can have an input output combination. So now we can go down to two states only because we can say the last input is a zero, make the output zero for either input. Last input is a one, and then we can split it up into two different statements. Earlier, we had to have two different states for this because the output was tied to the state. Now, I can have a different output for a different input because it is tied to the arrow, not the state. Let's see that. So, that allows me to do this job, same job, in two states. I'm only looking at the last input bit here. I'm not looking at the last two input bits here. If the last input bit is zero, make the output zero for either input. If the last input bit is a one, make it a one if your new input is a one, right? that would have made it two consecutive ones. Make it a zero if your input becomes a zero because the output can change as soon as you know your new input. You guys see that? So, if you capture that sort of thing into the state diagram, you only have two states. State zero indicates that your last input was a zero. If your last input was a zero and you get a zero, you will stay there. And while you are staying there, you, as soon as you get your in, new input of zero, your output is also zero. Let me also mark this over here. This is input. This is your output, input slash output. That's the uh, that's the standard we are going to follow. We are not going to switch it around. Now, from state zero, if you get a one, that is the first one. Your output is still zero, but you will move to this new state in which your last input was a one, right? Last input was a one. Now, if you are in state one every second or third or fourth one you get you will stay there while your output is a one but the moment you get a zero from here you're going to break the chain go back to state zero your output also becomes a zero you see that so we are able to do the same job so we can we can call this got zero state and then we can call this got one state right so now we, we can do the same thing but with two states the, the 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 advantage is this because from every state there are going to be two arrows coming out one for input being zero one for the next input being a one we could have two separate outputs attached to that that's the advantage we are not limited by the state now all right questions about Consecutive ones detection using a Moore as well as a melee. And if you put them side by side, you can see, all right, I needed two flip-flops to do this. How many flip-flops do I need to do this? One. That's right. Two states, one flip-flop. That's it. Which is why melee is melee type of FSM is the uh, designer's choice because you can do this in fewer states. Can we build it? Sure, absolutely, we can build it, but not right now. 
You can build it with any flip flop that you may choose. But uh, we are going to do that in the next lecture, which is titled FSM Design. Uh, and my goal in FSM Design is going to be to sort of um, not put you guys to sleep because once you have, think about this. Uh, did, did we do this over here? Uh, right here. That is it, right? FSM seems really powerful. They, they are pretty powerful, but the complexity is the uh, uh, the complexity is only until the state diagram. Once you have the state diagram, you can go to the state transition table, right? Once you have the state transition table, then you can do that. You know the standard notation: present state, input, next state, and then whatever flip flop you want, and then the output. Right? You could do that from the state diagram, and then it'll be K maps, logic expressions, building the circuit. It's going to be boring. The interesting part is where drawing up the state diagram. After that, it's going to be of the same 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 idea that we have been looking at even from this the counter design uh lecture so we, we will take a look at we will take a look at we will take a look at examples but right now the the idea is what we are talking about concept of fsm next we will talk about design of fsm <laughs> all right Let's uh, come back to this. All right, so uh, questions here about Moore and Mealy. As we do examples, we will be doing like really, really, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive examples. We'll try to detect uh, a, a particular, you know, pattern, one, zero, one, one, right? Like, how do you, how do you detect a a, a particular a string one zero one one? How do you how do you design a FSM to do that? Whether it be Moore type or Mealy type. So we'll take a look at a little bit more, uh, you know, complicated examples. We'll do some uh, combinational lock. We will do you know a, a, a traffic light controller. We, we we will do a lot of examples, time permitting. All right, now. The more <laughs> nice. Uh, let's talk about the other side of the coin. Two things can happen when you're dealing with FSM. One, I will tell you what I want, and you design the FSM for me. The second thing is, I will give you the circuit, I will give you the FSM. You tell me what it is doing, right? So again, design versus analysis of FSM. Before we do the design, let us spend some time doing the analysis. So the next few examples that we are going to look at is analysis of a, a FSM. And to be fair to you guys, I actually asked you that question on exam two. Exam two, even though you didn't know it, you guys were actually doing a FSM analysis, right? You guys remember there was a there was a question about there was a multiplexer in there, there was a, a decoder in there, and there was a JK flip flop in there, and you guys were asked to write logic expressions for the output of the flip flop. That is, that was a finite state machine analysis problem. You guys didn't know it, but you guys were asked about it. So yes, you know that this is going to be uh, straightforward. Uh, but the the, the the critical thing is go now going to be, can we identify the flip flops? Can we identify inputs, outputs, state? Can we differentiate between them? Um, and then once you identify them, it will be about using characteristic equations of flip-flops and going through some Boolean algebra simplification, or you may also use KMAP simplification. So 
the even though we did not draw the state diagram we, we will be able to do that right so now the the fsm analysis reverse engineering also called as fsm analysis is you are given the circuit it will have some flip flops right so it will have flip flops it will have combinational logic and then of course wire connections right logic gates all that and then you must tell us what it does how will you tell us what it does well you can sketch the state diagram so given the circuit you would sketch the state diagram and in some cases you will be able to comment about looking at the state diagram you may be able to comment about what this fsm may be doing for example this is detecting two consecutive ones like that the first example that we are going to see is a moore machine now i want you guys to take a minute observe the things that are presented over here and tell me how do you know it's a moore machine there are some logic gates there are two jk flip flops in here i want you guys to look at it a little bit carefully and answer the question why is this a moore machine absolutely right output z does not depend on input x it only depends on what output z only depends on what output depends on look at it carefully and tell me what does the output depend on b what is b b is right but what is b a state right so it's a state of the second flip flop right so there are two flip flops over here we are naming them flip flop a and flip flop b two jk flip flops and z equals b b is a state it is the state or the current output of flip flop b output depends on a state b so it's not even dependent on flip flop a it is dependent on flip flop b output depends on the current state hence moore machine you see how simple it was now let's talk about how how are we going to uh, reverse engineer this and gate all right i don't need to worry about the and gate exclusive or gate well i know everything about exclusive or gate don't need to worry about that jk flip flop okay i may need to spend a little bit time talking about the jk flip flop so what is the characteristic equation of a jk flip flop does anybody remember that all right q plus equals j q bar plus k bar q it just rolls off of your tongue doesn't it now what is q plus what is q and what are j and k q plus next state q current state what are j and k inputs to jk flip flop j equals input uh, right, right right so be in general right so this this is sort of a general discussion we are going to use this characteristic equation of jk flip flop twice because we are going to need that for the two flip flop flip flop a and flip flop b now 
the next thing I'm going to, need, so I'm done with this, right? So all the components that are shown to me over here, whether they be combinational or whether they be sequential, I know their equations. I know the logic expression for AND and exclusive OR, and I also know the characteristic equations for the JK flip-flop. Now the next step is going to be to identify inputs, states, and output. How many inputs do I have? Only one. I'm calling that X. Where is X connected? It is connected here, 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 and here. Next, where is the output of the finite state machine? Z is right here. That's it. Now, once you have taken a look at input and output, let us try to go back to the Moore state machine and point out where are they in this diagram. Output Z is right there. Input X is right here. So where are the states A and B? States are going to be right here, A and B. Outputs of the flip-flops. Let's go back to right here. So there's states are A and B. A is the output of the first flip-flop. Uh, let me use a different color. And B is the output of the second flip-flop. Right? So that's going to be important. Where are the inputs? Identifying states, identifying outputs, and then writing down maybe the characteristic equations of all the flip-flops that are present to you. Usually this will involve looking up like a reference sheet for that information. We have done that. Next, at every point, I'm going to need this. So what I'll do is I'm going to maybe capture this guy from here. Take a screenshot where that is enough. And then I will copy it from here. And then I'm going to go to another page, paste it over here, and then work through this over here. The first thing I'm going to work on is flip flop A. Underline. Where is it? Right here. Now, my goal is going to be to write an expression for the next state. State is A. I'm going to write an expression for A plus. Right? Q, Q plus. Right now, my state is A. I'm going to write an expression for A plus. It's an output of the JK flip-flop. Okay, so that essentially means A plus is going to be what? J Q bar plus K bar Q. I'm just using A instead of Q because that's the state. What is J? Well, it looks like J uh, let, because I'm doing this for flip-flop A, I will call this JA and KA. Can anybody tell me what is JA? Pretty simple. I think Bennett already said that. X. Next, what is KA? Well, KA is X and not B. That's right. And then I can substitute these guys in here. To find that expression. So let me just work through that quickly here. I have A plus equals X A complement or uh, what is this going to be x complement or b ended with a i've used de morgan's law right away over there and if i expand it a bit more 
I'm going to get x a complement or x complement a or a b. That's it. Uh, maybe I use right here. This is an expression for the next state of flip flop A in terms of input as well as states A and B. I need that for the next step. The next step is going to be to write the state transition table. I need that. Okay, so let's do, do the same uh, procedure for uh, flip flop B. Flip flop B. Instead of Q plus, I'm going to have B plus. B plus equals J, B and B complement or K, B complement and V. You guys see that? I'm using the same expression here, by the way. Q plus equals J, Q bar plus K bar Q. It's the same thing. But now instead of Q, I'm using either A or B in the other case. And instead of J and K, I'm using J, A, K, A or J, B, K, B. I'm in the B one right now. Uh, so what is J, B? What do you guys think? What is J, B? X. What is K, B? All right, so this is going to be X exclusive or A complement. Yeah. X exclusive or A complement. Yes. And then B is B, right? So now let's put it together. Now let's put it together over here as B plus. So I've got B plus over here as JBX. A, B is X and B complement or A, B complement, right? So if I did A, B complement, what would I have? I would have X exclusive nor A complement, right? I would have X exclusive nor A complement. And then end it with B. That's right. Which then simplifies to what? If this is going to be X and B complement, or this is now going to be X exclusive NOR. So that means X A complement or X complement A ended with B. Again, it simplifies to X and B complement or X and A complement and B or X complement and A and B. I'm just going through the cycles over here. Uh, from the first two terms, I think I can pull out a an X to get B complement or A complement and B. I will have X complement and A and B remaining as is. And I think this guy is going to simplify down to B complement or A complement using 11D, right? So 11D is X complement or X and Y equals x complement or y this is property 11d that's exactly what is being used over there you guys see that questions about uh how things are going all right so next i'm going to continue this because i need to still uh work things are going pretty good nice I told you guys that this was going to be very straightforward. Next, I am going to copy this for B plus. 
this is going to equal what x b complement or x a complement or x complement a and b that's it i can leave it here or if i want i can just uh, maybe uh, combine the first two terms as in this way that is going to be an expression for b plus So I've got an expression for a plus the next state of the first flip-flop the next state of the second flip-flop the last thing that I would need is an equation for the output what is the equation for the output well that is probably the simplest z equals b that's it right so in general i can i can write this statement here in general what you're doing in this fsm analysis or reverse engineering is we are writing logic expressions for the next state variables and outputs in this case we only had one output but you may have more than one output you are doing that in terms of inputs and current state variables in our example that was a and b right so that's that's sort of what we did as our first step now using this we are going to do the next step which is to uh, write up the state transition table now in the state transition table there are going to be four columns mainly four columns present state input next state output and i can show you this from earlier we did the same sort of four steps present state input next state output that is going to be the case all the time so where are we we are right here so i'm going to draw a table here uh, let's say i will use a black sure and then i have first two for state then i have another one for input and another two for next states and the last one for output so in terms of states this is this is present states first one is present states oh yeah, yeah. next one is inputs or in this case just one input then the next two columns are next states then the out last column output in this case just one column z so what are the present states well there was a state for a and there was a state for b a and b input there was just one input x next states a plus and b plus a goes to a plus b goes to b plus depending on x and then output is going to be z now a b and x those are essentially functioning as the input side of our state transition table a b these are outputs of the two flip-flops they could be 0 0 or 0 1 or 1 0 or 1 1 now with the input they could have input for each of those states could be a zero could be a one so in total you will have eight particular rows in this table so the first two are uh, let's use uh, let's see zero zero 
0, 0, that's your first state, state 0 say, in which your input can either be a 0 or be a 1. And then similarly you have 0, 1, 0, 1, for that input can be a 0 or a 1. Right? You start with this state, the input could be a 0, that will transition to a new next state, and so on. Next two columns, 1, 0, 1, 0, last two, 1, 1. Then we have 0, 1, 0, 1, right? So we have essentially entered that table as we usually do. 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1. Next, we are going to go back and take a look at our logic expressions. Well, straight away we can do it for z because z was equal to b. So this should be pretty simple. I will copy this and paste it over here. And that will at least complete the output column for z. No issues there. Uh, next, for a plus and b plus, where are they going to be? Well, a plus is over here. A plus is, uh, let me copy it for maybe in the whole. Okay. And then paste it over here. Uh, maybe here. All right, let's take a look. A plus is going to be 1 when x is a 1 and a is a 0, right? That's the first entry. x is a 1 and a is a 0. So, right here. X is a 1, A is a 0 there, X is a 1, A is a 0 there, uh, and that's it. Those are the, the for the first product term. For the next one, X is a 0, A is a 1. X is a 0, A is a 1, is right here and right here. For the last product term, A and B, both A and B have to be a 1, which happens here, already captured and here. So everything else is going to be a zero. So zero, zero, zero. All right, I'm done with A plus. So I can erase this. Next, B plus. Copy it from here. Come back, paste it, drop it down. And then now, a has to be a, x has to be a 1, a has to be a 0. Mm, x has to be a 1, a has to be a 0. There and there and that's it. Yeah. Uh, x has to be a 1, b has to be a 0. x has to be a 1, b has to be a 0. There. That's it. And then the last one is what? 0, 1, 1. So this is 0 and then the last two should be 1. So that's right here. Everything else will be a 0. All right. So I hope that you guys are, are also verifying my work. Uh, hopefully this is correct. So that completes my state transition table. Uh, what should I call this? Should I call this encoded state transition table or should I call it symbolic state transition table? Right, this is encoded state transition table because everything is encoded in zeros and ones. So obviously the next step is going to be to draw the symbolic state transition table. But I don't really, you know, want to make another table here. So what I'll do is I will group this into, say, this is yellow, blue, that is pink here, and one more, green. So I'm essentially color coding my states. This is state zero state 1, state 2, state 3, right? So when a and b are 0, 0, that's state 0, and so on. And based on that, I can also figure out the next states, right? So uh, this is going to be in yellow. This is going to be in yellow. That's it. 
that is state 0 and state 0 there. Uh, in blue, what do I have? 0, 1. Right here. And that's it. Next, in pink, uh, let's do green first. 1, 1. Where is it? Right here and right here. And then, of course, the last two will be in pink. 1, 0 and 1, 0. Right? So that will say, so the way you read it is, if you are in state 0 and you get a 0, you go to state 0, self loop. If you are in state 0 and you get a 1, you go to state 3 in green. So I, I hope you start seeing how this could translate into a state transition diagram, right? So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to copy this guy from here. Add another page, paste it here, maybe make it tiny, put it over here. I need that for reference. Uh, how many states do I have in total? How many circles should I draw? I'm going for a state diagram now. State transition diagram or state diagram. I'm going to draw four circles because I have state zero, one, two, and three. All right. So I've got one, two, three, and four. Right. So I've got S, S, oh, yeah. S zero, S one, S two, S three. Next. Um, is it a Moore machine? Yes, it's a Moore machine. So the output should be part of the state. And as you can see, output is 0 in state 0, 1 in state 1, 0 in state 2, 1 in state 3. Okay, so that's 0, 1, 0, 1, right? So let me write the outputs as well. 0, 1, 0, 1. It's a Moore machine. Next, the arrows are what is left. So if you are in state zero, you get a zero, where do you go? State zero. How do you know? Go back to the state transition table and take a look. Zero, input is zero, you stay there. So using the state transition table now, we can start filling in uh, the, the, the arrows, right? So if you are in state zero, you get a one, you go to state three. Uh, that's for one, this is for zero. If you are in state 1 and you get a 0, you go to yellow, state 0. If you are in state 1, you get a 1, you go to state 3. If you are in state 2, you get a 0, you stay there. If you are in state 2, you get a 1, you go to state 1. I'm basing all these things on the state transition table. Uh, next, if you are in state 3, you get a 0, you stay there. If you are in state 3, you get a 1, you go to state. That completes your state transition diagram or state diagram. All right, questions about this. So that meets our objective of reverse engineering. Got the circuit. From the circuit, we were able to draw the state transition diagram. So, you know, in, in, in exam two, you guys didn't go all the way, but you guys probably went to this, this step. All right, questions about this example. No questions? All right. So uh, let me ask you this. How, how bad could this state diagram, uh, sorry, uh, how bad could this FSM be? 
Right now it has a, a AND gate, exclusive OR gate and two JK flip-flops. What else could it have? It can get very bad, okay. So what would make it really, really bad? There is a big pause indicating that you guys are typing a lot. Oh no. Decoders, latches, big muxes. All right. This is the same example that we did. Uh, analysis steps, sure, we did that. All right. So the next example that we have is a bit. Um, time consuming. I wouldn't call it difficult, but I would call it time consuming. And this is the same example uh, which sort of worked as inspiration for your exam two question. What is this guy? The first one, what is this? A mux. No, 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 a mux. There's a eight is to one mux. It's an 8 is to 1 max. The reselect lines, it is hardwired to be enabled. It is picking one out of eight inputs to go through. That's a max. Um, again, we have inputs as X and Y, uh, the outputs of the two JK flip flops as states A and B, and then we have only one output over here, Z. Uh, by the way, is this a Mealy machine or a Moore machine? It's a Mealy machine. All right. Ma why is it a Mealy machine? Z depends on inputs. Z depends on inputs X and Y. Right. So what is Z is going to be, Z is A, Y, and B, oh, A, Y, or B, X. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. So if it is A, Y, and B, X, A and B are current states, X and Y are inputs. So Z depends on inputs. The output depends on inputs, meaning Mealy machine. All right. So at least in terms of wiring the circuit, we know that it is going to be a mealy machine. Next, we have two flip flops, JK, two JK flip flops. The other thing is that is involved is two, two to four decoders. Right. So these are your two, two to four decoders. Two JK flip flops. So, what do I need to go through this exercise? One, I need a way to analyze this mux. Eight is to one mux. If you look at some of the back exams for, um, you know, for, for the, the back exams that I posted for exam two, uh, you will see this exact question. Is that NAND? Yes, NAND being used as inverter. You got it. That's a NAND inverter, NAND inverter. Oh no, this guy is a NAND inverter. Uh, and that's it, there's only one. Yes. But all the things, all the logic gates over here are NAND gates. Um, JK flip-flops, I need characteristic equations of the JK flip-flops. Do I have them? Yes. Q plus equals J Q bar plus K bar Q. Same equations. Decoders. Do I have a, a way to analyze the decoders? Absolutely. You guys did that in uh, what? Exam two. The outputs of the de decoders are max terms, right? So you are taking max term three from the first one, max term three from the second one, and then you are going through a NAND gate, and then that drives the JB input and so on, right? Like you're simply following connections 
and going through the logic expressions. So your goal is still to write what? Your goal is still to write a logic expression for A plus, a logic expression for B plus, and a logic expression for Z, which we already did. In terms of what? In terms of X, Y, A, B. By going through the 8 is to 1 marks, the 2 to 4 decoders, and the combinational logic uh, here. So, uh, let us say, let, let us say this. I, you know, I get it that it is going to be time consuming, but is there any part of this circuit that you guys are feeling like I would not know? Given the time, I would not know how to do this. So this, you know, if, if you want to look at where these are solved in detail, so for the marks, they are on the back exams. And for the 2 to 4 decoders, they are sort of on the current exam, exam 2, you guys did this. And actually, you guys did something very similar to this in exam 2. Instead of a four is, uh, 8 is to 1 marks, you guys had a 4 is to 1 marks. Instead of two two to four decoders, you had one two to four decoder. You still had, uh, I think, one or two JK one JK flip flop. Now you have two JK flip flops, right? So you're carrying out the same steps, except that it is a lengthier, like time consuming exercise. So what I want, I'm not going to be doing this uh, completely over here because it's a time consuming uh, thing. But I have the results of that analysis given on this particular slide. So if you guys, if anyone is, uh, you know, a little bit unsure about the procedure, I would highly recommend that you go through this. Uh, and, you know, let me know if you have any questions about how do you write the output Q3? Well, Q3 is max term three. Inputs are A and B. So that would be what? A or B, right? That would be Q3. That's right here. Uh, a a complement or B complement. That's max term three. And similarly, you're going through all these steps to to write that. So I want you guys. I want to. Uh, I want you guys to try this uh, after the class. And let me know if you have uh, any sort of questions. Uh, but before we jump to the next topic, I just want to say. All right. Is there anything in this apart from being time consuming? Do you guys see anything over here that could, uh, that, that we need to address, that we need to talk about, or that might raise confusion? So for example, if you look at the 8 is to 1 marks, the output of the 8 is to 1 marks is essentially driving the J input, right? So when you ra start writing the equation for A plus, you will need JA. JA is output of the eight is to one marks. So you will need to analyze the eight is to one marks first and then use that to go further. All right, I'm not seeing any, any questions come in, but okay. So now suppose that we, are, we have reached here, right? So we have reached here with uh, A plus, the uh, uh, a logic expression for A plus, B plus, and Z in terms of current states A and B and inputs X and Y. We have reached there. What is the next step? From the logic expressions, we will have to write the state transition table. So the state transition table based on those exact logic expressions has been filled out for you. You have A, B as the two state variables uh, X and Y inputs, next state, again, you see the same, the same sort of uh, process here, present states, inputs, next states, output, same four columns. Now, based on the, the, based on the logic expressions, 
because now we have a b x y you have 16 rows in this table and then based on the equations that you derived a plus b plus and z you can fill out everything that is shown in the red and it has already been done over here so what we'll do is we'll try to transfer this state uh, what is this is it, is it a encoded or symbolic it is right now an encoded state transition table and suppose that we had uh, sort of isolated this for state 0 where a and b are 0 0 and state 1 right here state 0 is right here and then state 3 all are 1 1 there and then state Right. Using that, can we draw it, draw the uh, state, the, the arrows? Can we complete this arrows? Um, now, before I do that, I want to point out something. Earlier, you guys said this is a mealy machine, right? It is a it is wired as a mealy machine. That's what you get. You guys said, and we agreed. It is absolutely wired as a mealy machine because Z depends on inputs X and Y. So it's a mealy machine. At least it's wired as a mealy machine. Having said that, I want you guys to observe this state transition table carefully. Look at the output column Z and then look at the present state columns for A and B. Do you guys still believe that this is a mealy machine? Yes. There's no dependence between Z and AB, right? Zero, zero. Okay, okay. Over here, it is, it, there is there. Over here, Z is zero, zero, one, one. Over here, A and B are zero, one. Z is changing while A and B are not. Z is changing while A and B are not. Z is changing while A and B are not. You guys see that? So there is dependence on X and Y. So this is wired as a mealy machine but it also behaves as a mealy machine the reason why i say that is because that's not always the case all right let us try to complete this from state zero what should i draw if i am in state zero and i get an input of zero on x and y where should i go well i should just stay there right so that would be right here. My input is 0, 0, and my output is what? A 0. And I will stay there. Actually, my x and y could be 0, 0, or could be 0, 1 for the same arrow, right? So in fact, I can actually just erase this guy and put don't care over here. So let's say 0x. Uh, the x might be getting confused with the x over here. So I, I'll leave it at 0 dash. So x is a 0, y doesn't matter, output is a 0, you have a self loop. You guys see that? So that takes care of both of these. Then for 1, 0, what do you have? 1, 0. If your input is a 1 and a 0, your output could be a, it's just a 0, right? So if you are in 0, 0, your next state is 0, 0. I'm going to be doing this now. This particular column. Start with yellow, go to yellow if input is 1, 0. So this, comma, Another way of doing the same thing is input is a 1 
and a zero on x and y, output is a zero, right? So this can be part of the self loop as well as the other one can be a part of the self loop. But if your input is one one, you go to zero one. Zero one is the blue state. One one, output zero. You guys see that? Next, let us focus on blue. Zero zero. Uh, if your inputs are zero zero, you go back to yellow. Output zero. Uh, zero one. You go to one zero. Output zero. One zero. You go back to that. Uh, all right. So let me just put it over here. One zero goes to zero zero. Output is one. Next, uh, one one. From here, I get one one. I go to one zero. Output one. You guys see that? That takes care of the second case. And similarly, you can do it for starting from green and starting from pink. The complete diagram shown over here. Inputs slash output. Questions about this? So I hope this this uh, exercise. Uh, you guys are able to find it time consuming, but nothing in this uh, should be sort of conceptually difficult, right? Time consuming, sure, yes, absolutely. But that is it, time consuming. Ready to move forward? Or we have questions. All right, I feel like you guys are stuck with this. Are you guys worrying about the size of this state diagram? You, of course, will not have to tackle something of this size in an exam scenario. This is supposed to show you that it could get complicated with combinational logic and flip-flops. The, so the size increases, the time consumed increases, uh, but I hope that this is um, not uh, anything else. Time consuming, yes. Okay, so let me move forward here to another uh, machine. Again, a mealy machine is shown over here. Uh, again, it's a, it's a mini machine because the output Z depends on states A and B, but also X, right? Because the Z is going to be, uh, so the output over here is what? A complement and, or B and X. Uh, over here, it is going to be X complement and B. Over here is going to be the second part. Over here is going to be A and X. What is the third NAND? What is the third NAND gates at the bottom supposed to represent? Third NAND gate. These guys. So this is uh, output. How is the output Z related to the states and the inputs, right? So this is, so if you think about the SOP, right? And, and, or the SOP, sum of products form, uh, we have simply added bubbles to it to convert into NAND, NAND, NAND. But it, it, it's essentially doing a, a y or b and x, right? So it's just logic 
diagram. So here, if I go back, output Z was dependent only on the state, right? But that's not the case in general. In general, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too far back. In general, outputs do not need to be directly state current state, right? Outputs could take the current state or the inputs go through some new combinational logic, right? So your output logic is what is that three NAND gates. You see that? Yeah. So those three NAND gates are, you know, combinational output logic G block. Let's go here. We are doing this. So, if you write an expression for Z, you know that it is going to have A, you know it's going to have B, which is fine. Those are the current states, but it is also going to have X involved. Uh, so, in the chat box, the question is so the three NAND gates is for the input portion of the melee and everything else is for the state portion of the melee. Uh, so, this is the output combinational logic. This is the uh, actually, this is the input combinational logic. And these two are the state memory. You see it? So let me let me let me go back and uh, kind of highlight this a little bit better. So if I go back here, there is next state logic f f state memory G, right? You see it now? All right. Let's come back to the one that we were doing right here. Okay. So D flip-flop is present. JK flip-flop is present. D flip-flop is going to be pretty straightforward because Q plus equals D, right? And in this case, we are calling it DA. Q plus equals D. The D input is DA. DA is actually being derived from a new uh network here what is da da equals uh a or x ended with b right so that is da and that da is connected over here so we can say a plus a plus equals whatever you connect to da what is da a or x and b right? very simple as far as at least the first d flip-flop is concerned for the JK flip-flop, we are going to need the characteristic equation of the JK flip-flop. J Q bar plus K bar Q. In this case, Q is your B. So we are writing an expression for B in terms of what? A, B, X. Input is X, output is Z, A and B are your states. So again, a similar example, but there is a difference in this. The difference is Z is dependent on A, B, but also X because of this particular logic, output logic. Because Z is dependent on X, we are calling this a melee machine. However, if you take this, write expressions the same way we have been doing, write expressions for A plus B plus Z, put them through a state transition table, and then draw the state diagram, you are going to see, you are going to observe this. Z equals what? This by the way is zero, zero. Z equals B, that's right. Now if Z equals B, Earlier, we called it a melee machine because it was wired in a melee machine form. So this is an example where we
you have wired the circuit like a mealy machine however it is behaving like a Moore machine so the output is still dependent uh, uh, is, is tied to the state right so you, you complete the state diagram for this exactly the same way we did earlier self loop loops are omitted from here because they are going to create a mess even more mess than this is however the point here is this is wired as mealy but it behaves somewhat like a Moore machine right so the state correlates z but it happens asynchronously but the idea is that because of how it was wired we called it mealy but the logic expressions worked out in such a way that z became independent of x you guys see that so that's also a possibility where you are wiring things like a mealy machine but you your behavior of that uh, may be somewhat like a moore machine so it's just an efficient circuit then that's right all right so that is all i have for you guys in uh today's class um this completes our discussion on finite state machine concept in the next class we will start talking about fsm design right so we are going to be looking at six steps to go from the statement of a finite state machine to the design like this right so that involves uh, going through six steps in which the first step is to draw the state diagram which is what is uh, sort of the main uh, main problem there after you go to the state diagram everything becomes plug and chug um, and, and we'll see that design yes fsm design that's coming up next so this was fsm what are the two types of finite state machines and then given a finite state machine can we draw the state diagram so we think we did things in the reverse fashion in the next lecture we will actually do this from the so the first thing that we'll do in the next lecture is to design the vending machine fsm the same one that we did but we'll design it completely uh, there is a design question on the homework are we supposed to know that yet uh, there is a design question it, is it for the counters uh, let me let me stop the recording here and then well give me a second because i'm going to take a look at that give me one minute uh hold up i think this is the best easiest way to go about this Design, okay. So this is the state machine is there. You are asked to, well, this is the, the third question is fine, right? You classify that as a, which machine? And then you um, write the state transition table and implement it using two flip-flops. I, I think that, that, is, that is what we have, we have done. Uh, I was more talking about how do you go from the statement to a state transition diagram right so if you if you have this particular state transition diagram uh we have seen examples today where we can go from state diagram to state table once you go to the state table your your so where are we in terms of state table So suppose you you are uh, over here, right? Uh, let's see. Have we so state diagram to state table using um, so how would you get this done? A plus 
and B plus and output Z. Also for number one, since there is no input, do we just include the present state and next states in the stable? Yes. Right. Now uh, for number one, uh, where is it? Not here. Hold up, you guys. Uh, for number one, yeah, it's a counter, right? So you are you are uh, just having uh, Q2 plus Q1 plus Q0 plus Q2, Q1, Q0 as your columns. Um, let's see. Design a clock synchronous state machine with a state output table. So problem two requires you to go from a state transition table to a state machine uh, and using using two D flip flops. Right, so if you are using 2D flip flops, let me give you like a heads up on this. You have two columns from the present state, then you have inputs, then you have next states, right? The next thing that you can do is you can say DA plus and DB plus. You see, because they are four states, you are going to need two flip-flops for that, right? If you are going to need two flip-flops for that, let us assume that we are using D flip-flops. Then you have two columns here, one for DA and one for DB, right? First flip-flop and second flip-flop. Uh, not even plus, DA and DB, that's it. What is the equation for DA plus and DB plus? Well, that is simply A plus and B plus, right? So you would literally take these two columns and put that information over here because the characteristic equation for D flip-flops is D equals Q plus. So if you have two D, two D flip-flops, we have the next states, those are going to be identical over here. Now, if this was toggle flip-flop, then you need to figure out what you need to give at the input such that zero transitions to a zero zero transitions to a zero and so on. You guys see that? So you using the excitation table. Once you do that, write an expression for DA in terms of A, B, X, DB in terms of A, B, X, Z in terms of A, B, X, and then put that in the form of a circuit. You guys see the process there? So we don't even need to do that whole excitation still processing. Okay. So here, let me, let, let me take an example here. I will just take this, copy it. I'll go to the end, uh, sorry. I'll go to the end and paste that. Uh, If I was doing this with data flip-flops, then I actually don't need new columns. I can simply use this as DA and this as DB, right? Because the characteristic equation is D equals Q plus. Using the same thing, I can write equations for DA, DB, and Z in terms of A, B, and X. Once I have these equations, I can do this. How many flip-flops are there? Two of them, right? So I'll draw, draw two D flip-flops.
then I will call this maybe flip flop A, then flip flop B, right? So the output over here is A, the output over here is B. The input over here is what is DA and input over here is DB, right? And then Z is something else. Because I have these equations, I can wire the circuit to get DA and DB or Z in terms of A, B and X. I get A from here, I get B from here, X is my input, right? So it goes through a combinational logic here. You see that? And then for Z, again, there will be a combinational logic for Z, inputs uh, will be from here, A, B, X. All right. Do you guys feel like you, if you guys are not ready for this homework, we can extend it. You guys think that an extension is warranted for, for this homework? All right. So we are talking about Tuesday or we are talking about Friday. All right, let's, let's, let's do it. Having the FSM design lecture before due date would help. All right. I feel like I learned most of for this homework like today. All right. So Tuesday, sure. Like Tuesday would be sufficient. All right. All right. All right. I will move the due date to Tuesday, you guys. I thought we would we would have completed the discussion by now, but we are not there yet. All right, we'll we'll do it. We'll do, make the due date on Tuesday. But now the due, the homeworks are going to be on Tuesday, you guys. Oh, you <laughs> oh. I think it has, has All right. Okay. So for the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll make homeworks due on Tuesday. All right. Uh, so I will make the changes on grade scope uh, and on Piazza. You guys can uh, take one more class day for uh, for the homework. All right, let me stop recording here.